Hey, it's Robert Richman, author of The Culture Blueprint, here to talk to you about dealing with conflict in a self-organized style. So what that means is getting away from the whole parent trap mentality of it being the manager or leader's role to deal with people's interpersonal conflicts and giving them the tools and structures and protocols for them to figure it out for themselves. So the first is an organizational-wide protocol, and then the second is a conversation format for two individuals to work it out. So with the first, we have here me, Robbie, and I've got a problem with Jim. So under this system, and this was really pioneered by Morningstar, who is also the company that founded the Self-Management Institute, they're a really cool organization. They were the one that Gary Hamill featured in the first Fire All the Managers article in the Harvard Business Review, um, really pioneering a lot of the way for, for self-organization. And they came up with this model where if we have a conflict here, first, it's our duty to figure it out on our own, that we can't go to anybody and ask for their help or to mediate unless we've gone to each other first. Um, I would interject that if it's something like sexual harassment or something with a big HR concern to it, um, you know, something potentially regulatory that, you know, people need their basic training on that, that they hopefully got for a large organization, how to deal with it. And in that case, they do need the safety of being able to go to HR. But provided this is a conflict that's really about um, something personal or work-related, this model can really work. So we have to go to each other first before, and if we can't really figure it out on our own, then we can call in somebody else who acts as, not even as, as a facilitator, but somebody who hears, asks questions, um, helps understand, and hopefully can be resolved at that level. The big jump really happens, though. It goes semi-nuclear when it doesn't work at this level, and then it gets escalated to having a panel of their peers hear it out. And I actually tried this out one time when two of my um, uh, colleagues on my team, who I was technically their manager, they had this big thing. They each came to me separately, and I said, you know what? We're going to try this out right now. And I got a panel of their peers to hear the whole story, and they felt so embarrassed, so ashamed, so, so awkward um, experiencing this and seeing it all in front of the peers. They said they never wanted to experience it again. And they were never a problem again. They got along perfectly after that. So it's a really fascinating system that, that plays on just people's own internal motivations by first having them go directly to each other, then if they can't sort it out, have one person overhear it, and then a panel of their peers. And at Morningstar, if this doesn't work, for example, um, at Morningstar, you can actually ask somebody to leave the company. And, and that's the case where sometimes it would go through this whole thing, they couldn't resolve it, and it would go to the CEO. Um, so this is definitely one that you can experiment with and play with and see how, how it works for your company. The next one is about how to have that conversation that's between those first two, those two people. And this is called the four base conflict resolution model, um, slightly based off Robert Keegan's work uh, out of Harvard. And the idea with this is that it's these really simple stages. It's easy to mess up, though, I got to say. It's easy to mess up, but it's very simple, and practice really gets it down. So here's the model. One, knock before entering. This is key. You can't just start in with the argument and say, hey, Jim, I'm really upset with what you said at that meeting, because boom, they're on the defensive. They feel like they're being ambushed. They get their dukes up, you know, and they don't want to resolve it. They want to defend themselves. So first, this looks like, hey, Jim, I really want to talk about what happened at the meeting. Do you have time? this afternoon, tomorrow morning, really respects them, respects their opt-in, um, gives them the chance to, to get settled, get their thoughts together. Very respectful way to start it, and if you don't, it can be disastrous. Jim says, yes, I've got time this afternoon, let's talk. Great. So in the conversation, second base is first confirm the facts. So we need to make sure that we're even on the same page about what we're arguing about, and sometimes this can get resolved right here. And confirming the facts is confirming what happened in space and time that anybody in the room could have observed. So I would say, let me just make sure I got this straight. I told you my idea for the new marketing campaign, and you said, that's horrendous. Is, did I get that right? And then Jim might say, oh, you know, I was actually talking about something else. I can't believe uh, you thought that. Or, 
um, wow, you know, I was having a really terrible day. It gives them a chance to respond or say that, that I got it wrong, that I heard something differently. We need to at least agree about what we're having a conflict about. So that's what confirming the facts are. Make sure that people stay in the realm of understanding it's anything that happened in the room that anybody can observe. And then it gets to the I felt part. So I felt hurt when you said that. I felt like you didn't value my ideas. I felt that you're very embarrassed in public with everybody hearing you say that. And then Jim can say how, how, how he felt. And when you say I felt, you can't be wrong. But if I said, Jim, you're a jerk, that's a judgment. And then Jim gets back on the defensive. But if I say I feel, I can't be wrong about how I feel. And I can't say I feel you're a jerk. Um, that doesn't work. And once we sort out those feelings and, and, and we're heard that way, there can be a request. I request that next time you think my idea is terrible, that you tell me off to the side. Or you give me a good reason. Or you don't use such harsh language. Whatever that request is to make sure that this doesn't happen again. And then finally saying I am committed to. I'm committed to being a great team member. I'm committed to clear communication, whatever it is that we're both agreeing on at the end. And this is a very simple model, but like I said, it's easy to mess up because we don't always confirm the facts. We go straight into feelings or straight into judgments by third base. So I found that it does take having a triad around this first to for people to really understand it and learn it and grow from it. Um, but it, especially that first base, really can keep things from going nuclear. So the first model I showed you is an organization-wide expectation, and this is a conversational protocol format. Um, both are, are talked about more in my book, The Culture Blueprint, and you're welcome to email me, robert at cultureblueprint.com, with any questions.